Said be an actor, my son, but be a comic one. They'll be standing in lines 
for those old honky-tonk monkey shines. Or you could study Shakespeare and be quite elite. And you could charm the critics and have nothing to eat. Just slip on a banana peel, the world's at your feet. Make them laugh, make them laugh, make them laugh. Make them laugh. Don't you know everyone wants to laugh? My grandpa said go out and tell them a joke. But give it plenty of hope. Make them roar, make them scream. Take a fall, but a wall split a seam. You start off by pretending you're a dancer with grace. You wiggle till they're giggling all over the place. And then you get a great big custard pie in the face. Make them laugh, make them laugh, make them laugh. Make them laugh. Don't you all the what? My dad. I played around and played around this old town too long. Summer's almost gone, yes, winter's coming on. I played around and played around this old town too long. to Johnny, but Johnny can't come home, cause he's been on the chain gang too long. I sure
it's really about three words, think and thank. Actually, in Hebrew, it's two words, mode ani. It's mode ani. Mode ani lefanecha. Melechai vikaya. Shehechezarta bi nishmati bechemla. Bechemla. Rabba emuna techa. was amazing. So this is my world. Welcome to Mia's world. Welcome to City World Radio Network. And welcome to Mark Turtletaub, who's calling in from, I'm not sure where, but somewhere out in the ether. Hi, Mark. Hey, Mia. How are you? I'm great, Mark. uh, I recently saw Mark's uh, movie, most recent movie, which he directed called Puzzle. And it's quite overwhelming. We'll get into a lot about conversations about the film and about Mark and about the script and uh, everything about his his project and more. But first, let's just hear on this sultry Tuesday night in New York City. It is about 190 degrees <laughs> out there, but it is beautiful in the studio here. Uh, and I'm really excited to have Mark Dirtletaub on the on the air with me. And Jade, welcome to Jade Zabrich, who's our engineer and singer-songwriter and does Sky's Crescent Radio. And are you having any gigs coming up? Uh, Next Thursday, I'll be at Stratosphere Studios. Stratosphere Studios a week from Thursday. Okay, Jade Zabrich. So let's just hear what we heard this week. Um, As you know, my listeners know on Mia's World, I play a medley of music based on who was born today or somewhere near today or things around the date, which is August 28th, 
uh, which is kind of a symmetrical date. So first we heard, because in honor of, of course, Leonard Bernstein's centennial 100th birthday, Saturday, August 25th, we heard his beautiful song, Some Other Time, from On the Town, Adolph Green and Betty Comden collaboration. And Mark is big on collaborations. I want to talk about that, too. Um, So then we heard Kenny Drew, the jazz pianist, When I Wish Upon a Star, beautiful ballad by Lee Harleen. Kenny Drew, born August 28th. Then Peter Washington, jazz bass player, playing bassa, one of my favorite Brazilian sounds, bassa, the Jim Snidero Quintet from the album Vertigo, followed by a completely different sound, French singer-composer Sophie Gale from the Baroque era, 1775, born in Paris in in 1775, August 28th, Boleros. And then the famous Paul Robeson, 1949, uh, the riot prevented him from singing near Peekskill, New York, singing Old Man River from Showboat. Gorgeous, gorgeous voice there. And then American orchestra leader Glenn Osser, uh, also born August 28th, 1914. Uh, that was Hoagie Carmichael's ballad, Stardust. Gorgeous. And then Donald O'Connor, the American dancer and actor, famous for singing in the rain and many other th- things, but that was Make Him Laugh from Singing in the Rain, and if you can, watch that video. That's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> his expressions, right? <laughs> and his, his amazing flexible body, too. Born August 28, 1925. Uh, then American country music singer and guitarist Billy Grammer with Gotta Travel On. Another August 28th baby, Clem Catini, the English rock drummer from the Tornadoes with The Drifting Shadows. And Edward Patton, the U.S. soul singer from Gladys Knight and the Pips with On and On. And then, because of two reasons, Neil Simon having died Sunday, August 26th, alas, at the age of 91, and Charles Boyer, the French actor, both of them associated with Barefoot in the Park, one of my favorite all-time movies, so we played the theme song, Barefoot in the Park. Uh, Then, Daniel Serafine, rock drummer from Chicago with If You Leave Me Now, and Hugh Cornwell, the rocker from The Stranglers with Walk On By by Burt Bacharach. And Wayne Osmond from the Osmond Brothers, You've Lost That Love and Feeling. Shania Twain, You're Still the One. And Rick Recht, a Jewish singer with Modi Ani, meaning I am grateful, which I am very grateful tonight. Leanne Rimes with her famous blue American country singer, Leanne Rimes, uh, born in Jackson, Mississippi. Ed King's Sweet Home Alabama, co-written with Ronnie Van Zant and Gary Rossington. And finally... I love to have my guests select a music, and tonight my guest, Mark Turtle Pow, chose Horizons, which is one of the songs from his recent movie, Puzzle, and that was Dustin O'Halloran and Annie Brune. Beautiful, moving, moving piece, and, and so is the movie, and so is that song, and so is that singer, Annie Brune. Um, so a few more birthdays today. Uh, we went through a lot of musicians, um, besides... The ones we heard, uh, we had Roger Torrey Peterson, who's an American ornithologist and writer, born in 1908 today. A director, Bruno Nuiten, f- the film Camille Claudel. I remember a uh, beautiful film, which I'd seen years ago. Daniel Stern, the actor from Wonder Years, City Slickers, born today, 1957. The Olympic gold ice skater, Scott Hamilton, born in 1958. The American film director and producer, David Fincher, born in 1962. From the Gone Girl and the Social Network, and the American Technology Executive Sheryl Sandberg, born in 1969. Okay, some funny holidays today. It's Bow Tie Day, so get your bow tie on. It's Race Your Mouse Day. I don't know if it's the real mouse or your computer mouse. <laughs> it's Pony Express Day. It's Crackers <laughs> Over the Keyboard Day. It's Radio Commercials Day, and we're not doing too many commercials here. And Rainbow Bridge Remembrance Day, in honor of the pets we've lost. Um, A few interesting events today on August 28th, 1609, English explorer Henry Hudson discovered Delaware Bay. Uh, In 1655, New Amsterdam and Peter Stuyvesant barred Jews from military service. This is why I love doing this show. It's so many interesting facts. 1837, pharmacists John Lee and William Perrins manufactured Worcestershire sauce. In 1845, Scientific American magazine published its first issue. Um, in 1898, Caleb Bradham renamed his carbonated soft drink Pepsi Cola. 1907, UPS was founded. 1921, Babe Ruth started a streak of extra base hits in nine straight games. In 1922, WEAF in New York City aired the first radio commercial. In 1946, Film Noir, The Killers, premiered, directed by Robert Siodmak, starring Burt Lancaster and Ava Gardner, based on a story by Ernest Hemingway. 
In 1949, riot prevented Paul Robeson from singing near Peekskill, New York. In 1963, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Remember that well. Um, in 1963, Martin Luther King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. In six, 1965, Bob Dylan b was booed for playing the electric guitar at a concert in Forest Hills, New York. So if you want to look up any of those things and follow up on some historical facts, go to it. Um, Okay, so we're just going to do our weekly wrap-up of the news in rhyme. So here we go. We love to brighten up the news. Despite all the gloom, we like to have it sparkling. So here we go. Alas for John McCain, whose superactive brain finally gave out from the tumor, no doubt, his legacy, our gain. Superdelegates are dismissed. They're dissolved into the mist. The DNC clout has voted them out in this new political twist. The Fed won't stop rate hikes. The city won't stop peddling bikes. The economy's high, so the question is why? Two more rate raises forecast? Yikes. The Fed should be getting heat while on its annual retreat. Just what's their goal while in Jackson Hole, Wyoming? Isn't that sweet? The economy's doing so well, so why bother with rate hikes, pray tell? Trump's digging in. In the end, who will win? Should we buy or sell? Rapper Drake's getting educational. His lyrics are inspirational. Social media take on words by Drake are like theme and variational. Like Kiki, are you reading? Which seems to be succeeding. A plea for college and a nod to knowledge. Nothing at all misleading. Ethel Kennedy likes to sail with a country western male. Round Hyannis Bay with Kenny Chesney. Hooray, like the Holy Grail. Ethel, 90 years old, and Kenny is 50 and bold. He sang as planned, This Land is Your Land, honoring RFK like gold. For comedy, some sad news, the playwright of Biloxi Blues, the Marvel Neil Simon, it's all in the timing, he certainly paid his dues. From Barefoot in the Park to Brighton Beach Memoirs, a spark of screen and stage, he lit up the page, the theater now feels quite dark. And it's National Bowtie Day, so accessorize away whatever you got. Stripes, polka dot, now where is my Chardonnay? And that is the, <laughs> the week in rhyme. Politics, sports, what have you. We like to brighten it all up. On Mia's World, City World Radio Network. And so welcome again to my guest of the week, Mark Turtletaub, director of the Puzzle. I want to say The Puzzle, but it's just Puzzle, right, Mark? It is just puzzle. It's just that one word, wrapping it up in, in one word. I, I just have to say, I, you know I like to do wordplay, or most of you know. And so I had to do an anagram of Jigsaw Puzzle, and it came out, you ready for this? It came out, Wise Jazz Gulp. <laughs> so I, I kind of mm -hmm. thought that was funny, because it's like an improvisational, rich, uh, lush, picture filled with gulps of, of wisdom and jazz to me. Um, so, Mark, I mean, I don't know how you found this project, or did they find you? It's a, it's a co-production of uh, Big Beach and Olive Productions, correct? It found me, uh, Mia, and uh, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, yeah. Two friends who are producers, uh, Ren Arthur and Guy Stodel, uh, sent it to me knowing I was looking for a project to direct and it's rare to get one that's so well written uh, just crossing your desk. Uh, that is, I mean, did you feel like it was just sort of, do you feel that that's a random event? Is it synchronistic? I mean, how did, it must have felt like Eureka or something. Or like yeah, I, you know, I think to a certain extent they know sort of the kind of films that I'm interested in. So uh -huh. it's, it, it, I, to that extent, I mean, I think it's, it, it's, you know, your work that precedes it sort of informs everybody as to what you're interested in. But then there's a certain amount of just, you know, they couldn't have known that when I read this screenplay that I would say, oh, I know that woman. It's a, it's a story about a woman mm -hmm. uh, uh, over the age of 40 who sort of finds her voice for the first time. And when I read it, I, I, I went, oh, I know that woman. That was my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's something obviously they couldn't have known. Yeah, which is really even more remarkable to me that they found you and that it did resonate with you and your personal background and your family. And I mean, do you, if if things have you rejected things that have come across your desk because they don't resonate, or is it? 
Or do people only find things that do resonate with you? No, no, it's rare. You know, Mia, it's rare to find something that's out, that well written. I've been producing, mm. uh, directing yes. only for a few years, but producing for close to 20. Right. And the great screenplays are very few and far, you know, it's far between. And when you get them, you grab on. And this was just one of those screenplays that came to me, and I knew immediately that I wanted to make it. So the screenplay, by the way, is by Oren Moverman and Polly Mann, correct? Right. Um, it's based on an Argentine movie. How do I pronounce Argentinian that? For about three months, and then someone corrected me. So it's an Argentine movie uh -huh. uh, by Natalia Smirnoff that was adapted uh, by, uh, by Oren Moverman, and uh, that's the screenplay I got. And that's, um, the film is called Rompeca Bezas, which means puzzle, right? Well done. <laughs> I practiced my <laughs> Spanish for this. <laughs> Rompeca Bezas, what a great word that is, right? Um, and the, yeah, the, right. the whole, like you say, the theme of the movie is, I guess, uh, a woman of a certain age, over 40, finding her own voice. But what's so beautiful, or one of the many things that's so beautiful about this film, because it's a very subtly acted, and, and the look of it is, there's so much nuance in it. Um, I, I give you credit for the directing and the acting, and of course the, the costume and the production values are, are really exquisite. Um, I know that you talked a little bit about when I saw the screening and the Q&A, you talked, I thought this was incredible, that uh, there's a transition of the main actress, played by Kelly McDonald, playing Agnes, the woman. Um, she's, it's sort of a contrast or a dichotomy in two, two parts of the film, the beginning and the end, not to be too black and white, but she, is, she sort of fades into the background literally with her, with her outfits and, and the costume design, right? I mean, the patterns of her dress sort of blend into the patterns of the, of the walls and the wallpaper, and then later on, but between the lighting and the costumes, there's much more uh, of a of a difference in her standing apart from her background, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean that's that's right, Mia, and it's it's the kind of thing that sort of directors obsess over. You know, before <laughs> we get to the set, we uh -huh. start obsessing over costumes and and the look of the house and all those sorts of things and, and the way uh, you know the, the the shooting angles, all those sort of things. And then, you know, you just hope that the audience doesn't have to pay attention to that. They mm. just sort of feel the difference, and I think that's hopefully that's what we've accomplished. I think that's true. I spoke to many people afterwards um, who were in the audience, and a lot of people just felt that sort of intangible feeling that she was sort of transitioning or oozing into her own persona or personality. And what a beautiful actress she is, Kelly McDonald. Yeah, you know, when, when Kelly and I first talked about it, she, the, the way she described it I thought was beautiful. She said, first of all, it's not a midlife crisis, mm -hmm. it's a coming of age. Mm. This is a woman over the age of 40 who's just for the first time finding out who she is. And yet, and I didn't want her to be dull or, or, or in any way, uh, I wanted to feel she was very, she was intelligent. Uh, but unsophisticated, and mm -hmm. so you would start to see her wit and her intelligence, and the way Kelly described it, I thought was really apt. She said, I want to have it leak out. Mm. So you catch these little moments where she'll say something, and maybe only her older son in the movie is the only one that sort of understands her and sees it, until, of course, she goes to New York and her whole life begins to open up but it happens in little increments over the course of the movie until you get to a place where you realize how much she's truly changed. No, I, I, that's so, so true. Is that, th and that character is Ziggy, uh, played by Bubba right. Weiler, her son. And that, that Bubba Weiler, right. What a, <laughs> another amazing actor, very subtle, and that relationship is really beautiful to watch. He, it's, it's comical, it's melancholy, it's, I, I think... The contrast in, you know, it's not sad and depressing. The melancholy to me is much more uplifting in a way. Like, you know, it, it's great to be sad sometimes, I feel. And she, and she exudes that, and I think the sadness in Ziggy sort of floundering around and, and trying to find himself along with her trying to find herself, I think it's, it's really realistic and identifiable, and their acting really 
is, a, is uh, does justice to the script and, and to your directing. Did you talk about, I mean, did you, how, what was your method of directing? So, first of all, I, I, my method, Mia, is I don't rehearse, mm. which, uh, and I think we talked about that a bit when yes. we did the Q&A. And, and the thought there is when you have world-class actors like Kelly McDonald and Irfan Khan, mm. the great Indian actor, right. and David Dem, and this whole cast is, right. is really pretty incredible, that you, you know, it makes a director's job really easy when you have people that talented and you just sort of uh, get out of their way. Uh, there's, I think I may have mentioned to you, there's this well-known director who said, every time I cast an actor, it's like a little death. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking in this interview, what did he mean? And what he meant was he had an idea how each and every role should be played and how each and every line should be said. And no actor was going to do it exactly that way, so it was like a little death to him. Right. And for me, when you cast a Kelly McDonald uh, and Irfan Khan, and a David Demon, they're going to bring something that you didn't expect, and that's an incredible opportunity. So for me, we talked about scenes, we talked about what was happening in critical scenes, but then I wanted the actors to get on the set and to, for it to feel much like live theater, mm. that it was going to be fresh. If they rehearsed it beforehand, then they'd either be trying to repeat it, right. or the other actor would be responding to what they had done in rehearsal. Right. And I think it comes across, people tell me that when they watch the film, it feels like real people living life. It, it absolutely did. I, there's something, like I say, it didn't feel tangible, like you could put your finger on anything, but it was very real to me. Um, speaking of fingers, it looked like, it seen <laughs> this is something I thought about, that the, char the character of Agnes liked to work with her fingers. She liked to clean, she prepared her own birthday celebration, and she liked to put jigsaw pieces together, and I thought that was an interesting thing. She really did like to work with her fingers, but she also had an amazing um, soul and mind, and I thought it was so funny because she couldn't really figure out the iPhone, but she had this amazing ability to work these jigsaw puzzles. Like, her mind was pretty amazing. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and that right. I don't think she. I, I don't know that she didn't know how. For me, the way mm -hmm. I felt about it, Mia, was she knew how. She right. wasn't interested in it. Right. And right. in a uh, lot of ways, people watch the beginning of the film and they think, "Oh, this is a period piece from 1950 or uh -huh, something." Uh -huh. And then it's it's largely the way we shot it to get that sense because we wanted to give a sense that this is a woman who grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, in the same house, mm -hmm. had, uh, Ray had her mother passed away, so she doted on her father, then she got married, lives in the same house with her husband, who she takes care of, and her two teenage boys. And so I wanted to give a sense that she was trapped in time. And that's what you feel in the beginning until she pulls out that iPhone and you go, oh, this is today. Mm. Uh, so I don't know that she doesn't know how to. I don't think she's really interested in it in the beginning. And then, of course, over time, that changes. Yes. Yeah, that's very interesting, too, how an attitude can, can develop and evolve. Um, I, I loved hearing about, or reading about, I should say, your preparation for the actors and how you got them to work together and so feel familiar with each other and I, I, I believe you had them take cooking classes together? And well we all did uh, not only the uh, the actors but also some of the key crew we all went together uh, and found a place out in Brooklyn where they teach you how to cook and wow. Agnes is Hungarian so we did a mm -hmm. we made a Hungarian meal uh, some of us better than others. I wasn't so good at it, but the rest of us enjoyed the wine. Uh, and everybody cooked together, and it was a great way just for everyone to bond, and uh, especially the, the the actors that were part of a, this nuclear family, so that when they got on the set, they already knew each other and they felt comfortable with each other. Yeah, I mean, they always say, you know, sitting around a table, Jewish, Italian, or whatever nationality right, there it is, you go. It, it feels like a togetherness or home, you know, in some families anyway, or when I was yeah. growing up. You know, Mia, when we were shooting it, we shot it up in Yonkers, uh -huh. and uh, one day Kelly found a, uh, a lounger out in the yard, and she'd sit out in the yard in between uh, scenes in this lounger, and David said, I want one of those. <laughs> and, 
and then Irfan, not Irfan, but uh, Bubba wanted one, and pretty soon they're all out there in loungers. They found these <laughs> things called zero gravity loungers, which I'd never heard of. Where no, you I've never heard of that. And you know what those are, right? Where you kind of float back. Right. And so between scenes, this whole f- nuclear family in the movie were out there hanging out together. And we just gave them their time together, and I think it reflects in the movie. When you see it, you really feel like they're a real family. They they talk over each other, and and they're you know they they all uh, sort of inhabited characters that were uh, believable because none of them were stereotypes. They're all sort of, there. There's good and there's bad, and it's just like they're like real people. And I think a lot of that a is because you have amazing actors, but also they were really comfortable. Uh, with each other. Well, and that you sort of let them do their thing and, and trusted that, that that would work. I mean, I guess a lot of directors don't trust that. I, I don't know. I've never been a director, but it, it shows enormous faith in actors to let them do their, you know, do their own thing and, and let them in, interact the way they do as complicated people and complicated actors. Um, I think that shows enormous faith in... Well, you know, you, you, you can always make adjustments right. on the set. You can always right. make adjustments later. Mm-hmm. But if you don't interfere in what they're going to bring in from the very beginning, then you're going to get these incredible surprises, which are <laughs> you can't have predicted. Uh, when right. Irfan Khan, I mm-hmm. mean, we talked, I cast him, he was in Mumbai. We didn't meet except <laughs> over, over Skype. <laughs> we talked about key scenes, and then one day he shows up and he's acting. <laughs> and, you know, you know, you saw the movie. Yes. For those of your listeners who haven't seen it yet, he's spectacular. And the and his character is so, is is really one of a kind. You couldn't. I've never seen any actor do what he does. Mm. And in fact, the very first day when he's doing where he meets Agnes, the character, and he's 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 walking around in gigantic circles, and my cameraman <laughs> is following him around, looking at me like, "Is this okay?" <laughs> and I'm going, "Yeah, yeah, just keep following him." And. It, that's not something that if I had rehearsed with him, I could have predi- I could have suggested right. or predicted. And so those are the wonderful surprises you get when you have these kind of actors. Yeah, well, surprise is, is an amazing thing for anybody, and especially on film. It, it seems so fresh and real and alive. And Irfan Khan, he, he adds such a um, lightness and... Uh, I don't know. There's a spark that that he adds to the whole movie to me. Um, David Denman too, not the typical macho uh, mechanic. I mean, he's got multiple sides of him, like people do have, and he's got the hard side and the traditional side, and then he's got the sort of mellow or soft side, which again you let him explore. And I, I guess that's partly the script, right? And it's of course partly the acting. Yeah, it's a combination, but we did talk about it. David mm-hmm. and I talked about it beforehand, and these are the conversations that you have uh, where mm-hmm. I said, listen, I don't want a stereotype brutish father who browbeats his wife and, mm-hmm. and is oblivious to his kids. I want to know that this guy loves his wife, mm-hmm. loves his children, but he's trapped much as the way she is by his upbringing and, and, and the time, the way he was raised. And and he you know he looked at me and says oh thank you so much because mm. that's the way he envisioned it and so then when you watch a movie like this you don't often see characters that are that nuanced and it's because you know the intention was for them you know to see the good and the bad so when he says things that you would normally cringe at you do cringe but yes. you also know at the same time that this guy loves his wife. Right, right, which is it's so nice to see that, you know, amidst all the stereotypical characters that you see in TV land and yep. film r- yep. recently. Um, I just wondered, on a personal note, uh, are your parents alive? Were they able to see the movie? or? No, I dedicated uh, the movie to my mother. They're both gone, uh, uh, but I made sure I had my uh, my relatives all there who knew my mother. Oh, uh, they've came, phenomenal. They, they've come to the premiere. We had a premiere in New York and a premiere in L.A., and they uh, came, and uh, I think that was really special for them to have seen it. 
Oh, and absolutely. It was special, special for me to have him there. Oh. Uh, now, what what about your future, uh, like the next project? Do you want to talk about that, or is it too? I, I don't immediately have one. I'm okay. reading. Uh, I didn't write this one. I was, as I mentioned, I was so fortunate to get to get this incredible script from Oren Moverman mm-hmm. and. Uh, in fact, he and I just agreed we're gonna we're gonna sit on the stoop and 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 <laughs> have a tequila on Thursday night. Oh so, no, uh, we'll, tequila. We'll be sitting on the stoop uh, talking about uh, maybe dreaming up the next project. But oh, wow. I'm looking for I'm looking for the screenplay for my next project. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, I when you find a screenplay that's this well written, uh, you know, I want to make sure that I that I find something which is equally as uh, as uh, as affecting. Well, I'll tell you one quick story about Oren, which sure. is we, when we're at Sundance, we had this incredible response, uh, as you know, uh, at the Eccles Theater, which is, I don't know, twelve or 1,500 people. And right. The audience was just really uh, enjoying the film, loving the film, and laughing quite a bit. Uh-huh. And as you said, Mia, it's got melancholy, and it's got some humor, and yes. it's got, you know, real drama. Yes. Uh, but the humor played so well as it has in all the screenings i've been at wow. and and oren looked at me and he he turned to me uh, about halfway through and he said did i write a comedy <laughs> and <laughs> and i think you know i think what happens is when you have real characters that are real people and when there's real drama involved then when there is some humor it stands out in bar relief, and I think that's what that's what uh, goes on here. And so I just, you know, I'm waiting for another great screenplay like that one. Wow, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to get something. You know, when you've got something so good or so pithy, <laughs> lush, whatever right. the words you want to use, right. it's hard to. I don't know. It must be hard to measure up. But there's so much out there, and there's so much. So many stories that need to be told. So I guess something will emerge and find their way to you. Um, do exactly. You, yeah. Do you do you prefer the directing to the producing, or do you like to? I love them both. I think in producing you are uh, you're helping to bring uh, uh, art to the world, and I love that. Right. I love all the films that we produced. Some of them more than others, but I love m- almost all of the films we produced. Uh, oh. And I will continue to do that. And then on the directing side, it's you know I enjoy that because I love working with large groups of people. When you produce, you largely work with one person, the right, director right. primarily, a little bit with the editor afterwards, uh-huh. and certainly with the writer beforehand. Mm. But when you direct, you work with you know 125 people, and uh, I love that dynamic. I love you know all the incredibly talented people that come on to a set and and participate and, uh, it's like and a, then you get to curate the best of their <laughs> best of their work it seems like a humongous family you know and <laughs> yeah and you can interact with so many on so many levels um, it's really wonderful and and in terms of actual I'm sure you're asked this constantly so not to be trite but does do any of the crew or actors were they doing jigsaw puzzles during the filming or before, during, or after? <laughs> yeah, they were, Mia. Uh, particularly Kelly. Uh, she took a liking to doing jigsaw puzzles, and she's very facile. And, and uh, as you pointed out, she works with her hands a lot. And yes. so she she started doing a puzzle off the set, just ah. near the set, but off the set, a thousand piece. Oh, and, my and gosh. After a while, a half a dozen folks in the crew started to join her, <laughs> and so they almost couldn't wait to get done shooting so they could get <laughs> back to the puzzle. <laughs> That's very funny. I just found one in the in the childhood home I grew up in. I said, "Oh, I'm taking it out now." I think it was only 500, though, so it's not quite that that <laughs> challenging. But such a um, such a mind a- emotional. I love him. I love him. I just loved watching the um, dynamic between. The two of them working, you know. I thought it was quite funny. There, there was that comical element when, um, or how do I pronounce his name? Irfan. Irfan Khan. Irfan yeah. Khan uh, wanted to do it by color, you know, separate and organize by color, right, and she right. was doing it her way. And the methodical approach, and it, it, it just right. showed so many slices of of their individual personalities. And I just really, 
on so many levels. It should be, and, and not to mention just the, the locations are so interesting. I mean, the, the, the house in the, at the lake and the, the house where they grew up and, and his apartment. Where was that shot? His apartment. Yeah, we shot that in New York mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, in the 70s uh, on the west side. As wow. if to, we, we shot it as if it were down in the, in the West Village. But, mm-hmm. uh, and it's this incredible house, as you said. Uh, but what we did, is, as incredible as it is, we took all the furniture out. Uh, and it was amazing furniture. But I wanted to contrast it to the house in Bridgeport that she grew up in, which was very crowded. And we blew a lot of Chris Knorr, our cinematographer, blew a lot of smoke into the house to create a sense that it was dense and heavy. And Rochelle Berliner, our, our production designer, uh, brought the walls in and, the, and did the metallic wallpaper that was very interesting. And all of that felt very heavy and, and dense. And then I wanted, when we got to New York, to feel just the opposite. And of course, we found this you know, incredible house. You can't duplicate it. But we took out all the furniture and brought bright light in so that you get a sense that as her life is starting to open up, uh, the spaces are opening up. And at the same time, you meet this guy, Irfan Khan, uh, who uh, is sort of banging around in this big house. His wife has left him, and you, you get a sense of his of his uh, emptiness in that house. Well, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that that's, was extraordinary. That was from intentional. Uh, we found this great house. Yes, uh, many levels of... of incredible things happening synchronicity and script and direction and color and and nuance and i really congratulate you on the on puzzle oh thank you man and uh thank you so much of course it's been a pleasure to have you on mia's world and hope our worlds collide again <laughs> and thank you thank so you, much to it's, Mar- been great. it's been Mark great being on thank you, so much. thank you so much have a great tequila stoop sitting with Oren. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you again. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. And that was Mark Turtletaub, director of Puzzle, and a uh, wonderful conversation. Thanks for listening to Mia's World. We're going to close out tonight with, in honor again of Leonard Bernstein's centennial, the prologue to West Side Story. So, West Side, East Side, North Side, South Side, wherever you are, go out and enjoy the evening puzzling, non-puzzling, do, do just whatever you want to do and enjoy the city, enjoy the country. Have a great night. Thank you for listening.
Jet boy. Hey, hey, jet boy. Jet, jet, jet. Hey! 